Tonight we have one of our strongest singers in the program, right? Fighter! The fighter! Bullfighter! From Mexico! But live in New York, certainly. Uh, a thinker who takes care of one of our key philosophers, Jill Deleuze, and he takes care of him in a way of defending him against all these other guys trying to make him a um, uh, spineless anarchist, you know, only there to enjoy the it <laughs> and having no really sense of science and strict thinking style. Uh, Manuel is totally not this um, way of interpretation and we are happy because we, we usually are attracted to Deleuze for totally different reasons than he is. But that's exactly important to get an, the other view of it and get it so well done and so well argued as he's usually doing it. Still he enjoys the fight so please afterwards nicht, don't uh, be nice to him, attack him. Okay, let's go to the fight. Welcome, Manuel Yolanda. Hello, guys. Tonight I want to talk about Deleuze, well, Deleuze and Gattari, because this is something they did together, theory of language. It's something, a talk that I've never really given here. And it's, a, it's a talk that I don't give during my class, so everybody should get something new out of it. The main part in their joint work where they sketch their theories about language, because it's really just one chapter, a relatively small chapter in A Thousand Plateaus, it's called Postulates <coughs> of Linguistics. So what I'm going to try to do is not stick necessarily to the order or the exact argument there because it's too compressed, it's too small. I'm going to try to expand on it following the Deleuzian uh, 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 lead but adding a lot of historical material in particular from my own work just to complete his basic ideas. One of the most important breaks that he did with linguistics and he did, and Deleuze did this early on. This is, there's some evidence of it as early as difference of repetition. He's probably his most important solo uh, book. Is he, his desire to break decisively with continental linguistics. That is, with a linguistic tradition that goes back to Ferdinand de Saussure. And specifically, <coughs> with the distinction between signifiers and signifies. Now, this is not something that he did because he had any animosity towards it, although I suppose the fact that this type of linguistics exploded on the French scene in the 60s and everybody from Lacan to Baudrillard and even people who did not agree with it would be using the word signifier. That may have been one of the reasons, but there are other reasons for it, as we will see in a second. I would like to start first of all by, by suggesting why we should be careful in using the notion of signifier. Not that it, not, I'm not going to give you an argument that decisive, that decisively destroys that notion, but rather a certain a line of argument to make you be careful when using, when adopting this particular terminology. And I'm going to use to, to begin with an example that has nothing to do with linguistics, just to set up the, the stage. About 200 years ago, in a completely different field, the field of chemistry, there was a great debate, a great controversy that got very bitter between a French scientist called Lavoisier and a British, a British scientist called Priestley, or an English scientist called Priestley. They were both studying related phenomena, combustion, respiration, and they had entirely different a, a, the terminologies and entirely different approaches to the question. Lavoisier thought that both respiration and combustion had to do with uh, an atom, a, par a, a molecule, a, a, an entity that he called oxygen. At the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, today of course we all know what oxygen is. You rent oxygen tanks, the masks come out in the airplane when the pressure drops and there is oxygen in it. We know that water is made out of H2O, we, want, we know that carbon dioxide that's producing uh, 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 climate warming has oxygen in it. 
But at the end of the 18th century, nobody knew what oxygen was or whether it existed or did not exist. Priestley offered a completely different interpretation. He said, no, it is not a substance. It is not some entity, some atom, some molecule. <clears throat> it is an essence, a principle of combustibility, which he called phlogiston. And while Lavoisier interpreted, they used actually the exact same apparatus to, to, to conduct their experiments, so there was no real difference between the laboratory equipment. It was all about not the interpretation, because they are not, laboratory scientists don't interpret in a hermeneutic sense anything. It was about different explanations. Interpretation and explanations are two entirely different things. One has to do with semantics, one has to do with interpreting the meaning of terms, the other one is is, is about giving a process that explains the production of a particular phenomenon. So they cannot, they cannot be any more different from each other. So they both had different explanations. One said, well, no, when combustion occurs it's because it's, it's getting a substance, oxygen, from the air and it's using that substance as a fuel. The other one said, no, things come already, say wood, a piece of wood or anything burnable, comes already with a principle, an essence of combustibility that we call phlogiston. And what, what when Lavoisier points to that air and says that air has oxygen, Priestley would point to say and say, no, that air is the phlogisticated air. That, in other words, that has room for phlogiston. So when things burn, things burn and it put out phlogiston and it needs to be the phlogisticated air ready to admit the phlogiston in it. Now, I'm trying not to make fun of Priestley, but you know, 200 years after the fact, the whole phlogiston thing sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Nevertheless, at the time, no one knew. And when one studies the history of science, one needs to study the history of science in context, in the context of their period, and in the context of the ideas that were there. At that time, there was no reason to bet on oxygen or on phlogiston. Both were theoretical terms, and we didn't know at the time whether they had real reference in reality. It was only 50, 60 years later when the table of the elements was put together by Mendeleev, when all kinds of other phenomena involved in oxygen were, were found to be compatible with the original theory and the, and the versions, the explanations using the phlogisticated air completely it broke down, that oxygen began to establish itself as a real entity that we could for the first time begin to believe that there was in fact something called oxygen out there independently of our minds. By the 20th century, once we had filled all the, you know, Madame Curie had already discovered radium and all kinds of new elements had been discovered, carbon was well studied, hydrogen was well studied, helium was well studied, oxygen became something that it is almost impossible to doubt the existence of. For the same reasons that I told you before, we would have to change a thousand scientific facts if we change our beliefs about oxygen. We have to believe that water is not H2O. We have to believe that we don't breathe oxygen. We have to, entire models of respiration at the, from the cells to the, to the large animals and plants.